It's not to be like the world and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. You can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. Hello, Humble Bees. Welcome to Tulips and Honey. All right, Humble Bees, welcome back to Tulips and Honey. I am your host, Lauren Herford, and today I am joined by a very special co-host. I'm super excited to have Kristen Everett back on the program. Yay, everybody's cheering and I got a little sound Hi. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back on the program today. We're going to be talking about something really, really super important. Sorry if I'm talking fast. I should slow down a little bit. I always talk a little bit faster after a live event, and we're recording after a mega live list, so... Like my, my, my flow is already on fast forward. And um, I just learned today that if you listen to Spotify, you can go up to like 3.5. Whereas on um, podcast Apple, you can only go up to 2% time speed. And, and that's always annoyed me. Sorry, that's random. But just if you really want to listen to me in an extremely fast way, you can do it over on Spotify. But anyways, all of that to say, I'm super glad that you're on the program today. We're going to be talking about a topic that is incredibly important and not something that I, as far as I know, I don't think I've directly addressed this on the program, but it affects all of us. And if you have children, this is, this is something that you're gonna have to deal with. So we're gonna be talking today about purity. And before we get like digging all the way to it, Kristen, TikTok, famous Kristen Everett here. What drove you to want to discuss this topic? (laughs) Oh man, you flatter me. Um, (laughs) I think that this is a very important topic and it's one that is not talked about a whole lot in a good light. Uh, So when I had been messaging with you about this, I was like, this would be good for some two sisters in Christ to talk about, two reformed sisters in Christ to talk about, because I don't see it addressed in the reformed circles either. Um, And it's important to know what the word of God says. It's important to know what the word of God doesn't say as well, because you see how toxic purity culture can be. And so addressing some of those issues that we see, not ignoring them, not shoving them in a closet and ignoring them, but actually addressing them, uh, which we should be. Um, So that's why, that's, that's why I'm here. I want to, I want to dig into this and I, who better to do it with than you? Yes, I am super yes. excited. I have heard a couple of people in in our camps sort of, you know, tiptoe around this issue. And a lot of times it's actually like aimed towards modesty, which mm-hmm. is such a small portion of this that I feel like it, it leaves this massive gap of, of everything else. Because you said something today in your live event that because uh, you're live on TikTok earlier today that really just hit hit home for everything that we need to discuss. And you basically pointed out that most people just don't even know what purity means. And when you were like, purity is an, is an attribute of God, and my brain was just like, duh, like, why, why does that connection never get made? That's the most yeah. important part about this topic yep. is what is purity even? So why don't you start us out there? What, what is this? What is this thing people yes. talk about? Purity is literally, it's just freedom from anything that contaminates, right? It is faultless. It's uncompromised. It's unadulterated. It's, it's pure. Um, so as when we come to scripture and we're reading about purity, it's often used as, um, holiness, it's used to describe holiness, mm-hmm. right? It's used to describe perfection, pure gold. We see it in the old Testament. Everything had to be pure in the temple. Um, it, like things had to be made of pure gold. Um, uh, the Lord has pure eyes. It uses that. I think it's in, um, Exodus. I'm not going to, I, I don't have very good recall on stuff like that, but <laughs> <laughs> there's multiple references to things being pure in scripture, right? And that is just being without flaw. Um, God is pure, right? So that's, that's why I was like, well, that's because it blew my mind too. When I finally made the connection, I was like, well, this is an attribute of God. Like, cause he is pure. He is sinless. Yeah. He is perfect. He is holy. Um, wow. and so everybody just takes purity and they make it about works Yep. <laughs> when they're missing a whole, like it's such a beautiful attribute to dig into and really learn what it is. Yeah, that is, oh man, I'm so glad that you pointed that out too. Like that the whole time you mentioned, I was thinking about like the silver and the way they talk about in the Old Testament, like purifying the gold and purifying, getting all of the contaminants out and everything. But mm-hmm. whenever you think about it and you listen to just the way they explained it, in other words, something that we're not capable of then because exactly we will never be perfect the way right. that God is perfect. That's not going to happen for humanity. And yet church after church after church, leader after leader after leader is telling their youth groups that they can put a ring on their finger and somehow magically achieve purity and not even yeah. explaining why, how, what, what even is it, it means? How, what a, what a missed opportunity. You could, yeah. you could literally be teaching these kids an attribute of God, which is not something that was ever mentioned to me in, in any of the youth camps or youth churches or anything that I went to after four, when I was 14 and we started going to church, never once was an attribute of God ever discussed. And, right. and there's nothing better than to bring out the need for salvation than to pinpoint the fact that God is pure. 
He is without contaminant. He has absolutely no sin. And when you Mm -hmm. hear that, and you know that you're going to be judged by that judge, that's the best segue into the gospel that you're going to get. And and instead they're talking about waiting until marriage, right? That's putting the cart before the horse. If you're telling children to behave in a certain way or youth or young adults, but they're unsaved, then you're, you're just telling a goat to act like a sheep. It's not going to work. It doesn't work like that. No, it absolutely doesn't work like that. And there's so many uh, repercussions that we've seen that we'll get into and discuss too, like why, why it's not the way that we should be doing it. And hopefully by the end of it, get into how can we kind of, how can we have these conversations? You know, especially if you're a parent, because we have to have these conversations with our kids one day. And I certainly would much rather my child know the gospel and that and the attributes of God and what scripture says about these issues rather than, nope, you just need to save yourself for marriage. That's what's most important that you save yourself for marriage. That's what's really? most important. So you can't, this is, this you is can't why it's expect, so important to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. It's where we're expecting lost people to act like saved people. And then it's not mm-hmm. going to work. It's not, that's not how this works. Your desire in your heart as a lost person is always going to be for the opposite of what God calls you to. So it makes no sense. But not only that, I have seen, even today, I saw really, really disturbingly a particular pastor whose ministry I won't name because I don't want anybody to even give him the attention that he clearly wants in the language that he's using, using this topic as a means of, there's there's no other way to say it, control. Like he, he's using this topic as a way to control the women in his church, not the men. It's It's not it's very rarely aimed at the men in these churches, but oftentimes this is aimed towards the young girls, aimed towards the women in a way where you've taken something that is supposed to be an attribute of God and you've twisted it into something disturbing. So uh, you, you've heard a lot from a lot of people. You, you talked about this on your TikTok. What are some of the ways that you saw churches abusing this, this teaching? Well, you're absolutely right to point out that it's usually aimed towards girls and women. Uh, I know for me personally, in my youth group, we would be separated into boys and girls and the boys would usually just talk for a couple seconds and then they'd go play games, basketball, whatever. And the girls were sat down and talked to almost harshly talked mm-hmm. to, too. It, it was almost like, uh, like we were in trouble. <laughs> right. Um, so I've seen, we've seen it weaponized against girls and against women in a way where, uh, we're, we're putting our whole value inside of our purity as a result. Yep. So the minute that we mess up, because we will, because we're human, um, right. the minute that we mess up, we think that we have lost our value. And it's easier to control somebody who thinks they have no value than yes. somebody who knows that their value is in Christ. Right. 100%. Um, that is disturbingly I've, true. It is. Yeah, it is. And I've heard it even down to where, you know what? And in a, in a sense, this is true. I'll just preface it by saying this. In a sense, it is true. Because um, we're supposed to take our thoughts captive. But they take it down to even your thoughts. So if you mm-hmm. even have a thought that is impure, it, then you, you've sinned big time. You better like right. you better not do that. And yes, like our thoughts are sins as well. We know this. But when it comes to these heavier topics that are honestly very difficult, because we have sexuality thrown in our faces from the time we're yes. able to walk, pretty much, um, we should be teaching people how to deal with these how to work yeah. through them instead of just saying, don't think that, don't do that. Um, because then right. when we do it, we're just like, uh, now what, what do, what do I do? I, I'm just dirt now, I guess, because yeah. I can't control my thoughts. Cause I haven't been taught we, how we can't, this, this is the problem with all of this. So you're sitting down a group of girls and, and in a youth group, how many of these girls are actually genuinely saved? And, and you're basically saying, and I don't know if they told you this, but I was told to put a rubber band around my wrist. And every time I had a, a bad thought to smack, to, to self harm, to keep, to convince myself not to have these bad thoughts that does nothing to help because we are, yes, as born again, believers, we are supposed to take our thoughts captive. Absolutely. A mm-hmm. sinful, unsaved teenager is not going to be able to do that. They're not right. because they are, they don't have the actual tools. And, and this is, this is my big issue with this as grown adults. You can sit down a woman and if she has shown all the fruits of the spirit, you and I, we could have this conversation together. You, if you saw me behaving in a way that you thought was sinful, you could sit me down and you could say, you're behaving like this. And this is why it's wrong and sinful. And you could expect two possible outcomes. The first possible outcome is I get huffy and I go home and I pray and I realize you're right. And I come to you and repent. Or the second one is I instantly realize you're right. Because for whatever reason, at that moment, the Holy Spirit decides to instantly convict me. And I repent because that's what mm-hmm. born again believers are going to do when we are con- we're right. confronted with our sin. We hate our sin. Our hearts have been changed. We despise sin. 
any kind of impurity in our lives. And the more we are sanctified, the more the impurities bother us. But a a false convert or a kid that has been raised in church but does not have any any sort of fruit, what, what are you accomplishing? Nothing. You are not accomplishing anything. Save your breath and your time and share the gospel with these kids. Right. And the, the whole thing with separating the boys, this really, this is really a problem that sort of shows you that perhaps youth group isn't the place for this topic. If you're right. separating the boys and the girls, perhaps this isn't the right moment for you to be discussing this. Because by the way, in case you were wondering, youth leaders out there, that's not why you are teaching. You're supposed to be teaching scripture. Right. You're not there to play games. You're not there to eat pizza. You have these kids' attention for one night a week. And I have talked to these young people. They are so sick and tired of being treated like they are too stupid to know doctrine. They want answers and you're not giving them. So they're either going to give up asking or they're going to go somewhere else. And they're going to hear the answers to those questions from like atheists and stuff. And they're going to assume, yeah, because those answers are out there. They're they're wrong. They're not good answers. We have great responses, but if you're not giving them those responses, you're not answering any of those questions, then they're, Mm -hmm. they're not going to listen to you. But Paul Washer made such a great point whenever he discusses these kind of things. And he, he doesn't put any of the, um, responsibility on young girls. He actually lays all of the responsibility at the foot of the man that's going to one day be the head of his house. The young boys who society has taught, they have no self-control, right? Like that's what society teaches. Right. They can't boys control boys. Boys will be boys. Nonsense. That is absurdity. Irregardless of whether or not a young boy is saved or not, if that young boy happens to have a child, that young boy is now a man responsible of a child. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it makes no sense to me to teach the boys to just sort of, I don't know, what are they even teaching them if it only takes a couple of seconds and they run off? No, no, no. You're bigger and stronger than a young girl. So you can overpower her. That there should be more, more concern over teaching young boys to control themselves in that case than not. But either way, these young boys need to be saved before they can even attempt to sanctify the, the flesh. Like right. you, you can't mortify flesh if you are unsaved. It's not going to work. You can clean the outside right. of the cup, but the inside is going to be full of dead bones. So it's abused in that way where we see... We see leaders aiming at, at young girls. You can, you and I would both know that there's a vulnerability that young girls have that young boys don't have. It, mm-hmm. it is true that there are some young boys out there that might have similar vulnerabilities. I, w- I grew up without a dad. Um, if you were a dad figure and you wanted to tell me that I should behave in a certain way, I was far more likely to listen to you. Um, mm-hmm. It's easier to manipulate sometimes whenever girls have emotional baggage. There's other ways that this is abused and mm-hmm. it feeds directly into feminism every time. Whenever this is aimed towards young girls to tell them that if they are not pure by marriage, like you mentioned, they are worthless. So, you know, and maybe you can get into this a little bit. What happens whenever we're not strong enough to physically stop the boy? We're not told that that's not your fault or Mm -hmm. the worst thing. And I have actually heard this said in church. We shouldn't have been alone with him. Yep. I beg your pardon. I shouldn't have. I, I shouldn't have. Were you wearing a skirt? This feeds into feminism, right? Like, like this is the argument yeah. feminists use. But here's the problem: the church is facilitating this. So, yeah. how how can we allow the church to continue to use this language when? And it doesn't happen to every girl, but it happens to enough of them to where there needs to be significant amounts of education in this area. Or, how, I mean, how are they going to end up feeling? What 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 does this lead to? Yeah. You know, I know firsthand because if anybody has listened to the first portion of our first interview or very first interview that we did, I talked a little bit about it and um, because I did the purity culture, I did purity rings. I made the the pledge to stay pure until marriage and was doing a really good job of it. I was doing great. Um, I took the pledge when I was like 10. Like I was like a child when I took the pledge, 10 or 11. Couldn't have been older than that. Boys are still gross at that age. Why are they even mentioning it to 11 year olds? They are. I know. I'm like, sure. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Keep myself pure. Sure. Uh, I mean, and it was kind of explained to me more and more as I got older, not fully, which I regret. I I don't regret. I wish that it would have been more explained fully, but you know, by the time I was 17, almost graduated, I was raped. Um, and it was like, my worth was just gone. Right. My worth is gone. I, all my worth I'd put into my purity and I was very self-righteous about it too. Everybody knew that I was a virgin. Everybody knew that I was saving myself till marriage. Everybody knew because when you're putting your worth in a work that you're doing and you weren't saved, like I wasn't saved, that just breeds pride that breeds yeah. self-righteousness and so when that was taken from me all of my self-righteousness all of my pride was gone it just was gone because now I was dirty I was soiled I was I was impure and so that sent me into a spiral 
I was sleeping with everybody at that point. I was like, forget it. There's nothing I can do to get this back. I am finished. So that just set me on my own path. And I said, forget that. I'm not even going to entertain it anymore. I'm already soiled. I'm already dirty. Why try anymore? Yeah. Why try to remain pure anymore? I can't get it back. That's so the thing what that bothered point? me the most. I was, I was watching, I was listening to you a while back because you do these great live things on TikTok and you went into this, which was really amazing because most, most women won't, but you actually discussed this live on your TikTok. And the thing that bothered me the most, whenever you're telling the story was that no one even gave you that benefit of the doubt. There was never a point where, um, the question was, was not, you've been out for a really long time and now you're behaving in a really weird way. Did, did somebody do something to you that they shouldn't have done? The question was always just, how dare you rather yeah. than what has happened because li- 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 just reasonably. And, and I haven't been a mom, but for like 10 years, but even before I was a mom having friends and stuff, we all knew if a friend of yours starts acting strange, all of a sudden something has happened to them. You don't just shut down and turn things off and just immediately go into a different direction for no reason. And it bothered me that no one, no one in your circle, no one in your church, no one around you said, what happened? What it was just automatically assumed that you just, oh, you must have given into your sinful desires. Um, Yeah. A lot of young, right. A lot of young girls, and I'm not saying this about everybody, but I know until I was like 16, I thought, I thought boys were disgusting. I, I mean, I had little boyfriends, but that was like holding hands and stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it was never a thought in my mind that I wanted to um, be active in a certain way for, right. for a really long time because I'm sorry, but the boys are gross at that age. You know, they've got like a lot of smells that don't smell so great. And sometimes they haven't yet learned how to use deodorant at, you know, 14, 15, 16. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, a lot of us girls, especially in that time frame, And I remember people like kids at school would ask me and it would just be assumed that I, I had been um, active and I'd be like, uh, no, um, gross. Ew. Are you, have yeah. you smelled, have you smelled these guys? Like um, they haven't even been to gym class yet. No, absolutely <laughs> not. And people would be surprised uh, and mostly just because I, I was not a church goer and I wasn't, you know, by any means considered a Christian, but other, other girls would be like, really? Wow. I didn't expect that. There was an expectation that Mm -hmm. um, unless you were wearing the purity rings and behaving in a certain way that you were loose, I guess is the right, is that the right word anymore? It's probably not. I probably just a really, really old word. Okay. That was was the assumption. The assumption for me was like everybody just assumed. And I was like, "Um, you gross. No, no, there shouldn't be a point where we look at young girls and they are suddenly behaving differently, where we just assume that their personality has just magically changed. If you know a young girl, because sometimes it's not as, as bad as it was for you. Sometimes it's somebody, I had a friend, an incredibly sweet young lady, and it wasn't that, but somebody touched her in a way that she didn't want to be touched. And that sent her in a really bad direction because yeah. we, we, as young ladies, we don't, we don't want to be touched. Okay. Don't touch us. No, stop it. No. Yeah. Um, but nobody thought to ask. She mentioned it to me. Yeah. I had the inside information. I knew exactly why she was behaving the way she could behave. She was behaving. So I was able to be there for her as a friend. Why was it that nobody even thought about that with you? Like, th- th- this, sorry, this is kind of a random thing, but it has bothered me since your live event that nobody in your life thought yeah. to say, how, why did you go from zero to 90 in five seconds yeah. flat? That makes no sense. But no, did nobody do that? No, they just assumed, like I said, that I was rebelling, that I was rebelling against my parents, that I was rebelling against God. Um, I was, you know, I was a cheerleader in high school. And so I was a part of like that popular crowd. And so I believe that they assumed, like you said, I was already active. I was already doing these things. They thought that I had already bit the bullet and was on my way to hell, apparently. So what were they going to do to save me at this point? I like, cause I've, I've told you before, like I was pretty much ostracized as like a child and made to feel like I couldn't do anything right in the church. Um, it was once I came here, I like the pastor was really nice to me. He was always kind. Uh, but the older ladies who had daughters my age did not want their daughters hanging out with me. And I never knew like why and all I wanted was friends and so I started to like overcompensate for that you know and I was I I want friends so I want them to like me so I'm just gonna tell them things and you know part of that was boys was being like well I've had a boyfriend once you know doing stupid stuff that 13 year olds some 13 apparently you didn't like boys I thought boys were pretty cute when I was 13 I mean I thought they were cute yeah for sure they were cute I would tell you about how cute they were and I had boyfriends but I as far as like being physically active with them that's the part that I was really really gross and yeah. I didn't really understand the obsession with it because I thought, well, yeah, of course he's cute and I want to hold his hand and I had crushes and stuff. But uh, anything further than kissing, I thought was really gross. Um, right. 
it, ew, ew, it was basically my response to all of those. And, and really, honestly, the bravado that people had back then to ask certain questions always took me off guard. Like, you just said that out loud. You just asked me that question out loud. Um, and I don't want to, I don't know you well enough to have this conversation, but anybody who knew me personally would have known that, that that's not, that's not the way I live. But in part of, part of the confusion, part of the problem is if you are not, you're not girly. I, I don't know if girly is the right way. Um, I had a figure at a really young age. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. I developed at a really young age and that was a problem because, uh, whenever you're really young and you look like you're about 15 or 16, it, it can um, cause problems. Now, luckily, I had an older sister who was a bulldog, and she did not let anybody anywhere near me. She was very overprotective of of me at that age, and so it never even. I didn't watch stuff that was inappropriate, mm-hmm. and I didn't understand that there was a certain way of behaving. All I knew was right. was that um, I liked this shirt. The shirt is pretty. I'm going to wear this pretty shirt. It never. I didn't understand why people would say things or make comments. So you go to church. And you see young girls that are not as developed. And then there are young girls that are developed. You can't say in your mind that the girls that are more developed are active simply because they got there first. Like that makes no sense. You're making assumptions and you're putting, and what they're doing is they're putting the sexuality. The church is putting sexuality on girls Mm -hmm. too young. Just period, period. Like we, and and they need to stop Mm -hmm. and we need to stop making everything about sexuality for kids, for these teenagers and start focusing, like you were saying earlier on the gospel, on making sure that our children know the gospel, you know, and then when it comes time for those conversations, why aren't those conversations happening in the home? Why aren't those happening? I understand not everybody has parents too. And so it is good and it can be good to speak about them in church when you do have, um, unbelievers coming to youth group because a lot of unbeliever kids come to youth group you know they yep. they like they like to come and hang out with the kids the it other would be kids safe to age. assume that most of the kids in your youth group are probably even the ones that have been in church it would be safe to assume that most of them mm-hmm. are in fact since since most believers get saved in their late teens right. um there are very few people who get saved at five six or seven okay right it would be safe to assume that all the more reason to teach theology uh yeah if you, if you have, and I think this is su- super important, but it's completely missing in um, in most churches. They they actually did this by name in our church whenever I was a, a, a teenager, but nothing came of it. But a great way to do this is to have adults adopt a child in the in the youth group. So if you have hmm. elders or um, spiritually mature believers, if they pick a youth kid, and usually whenever this is done, it's it's done in a way where like you're gonna fund their stuff. Okay, I adopt you. I'm gonna pay for all the stuff that you're gonna be doing in the youth group. But wouldn't it be better? If you found a young girl in your church and maybe she didn't have a mom there in church and you mentored her rather mm-hmm. than having this super awkward conversation with like, oh, one of the ladies that responded to you right. said that they like asked you to, to get into groups publicly, depending on where you were at in your um, activity. I don't know how to even pronounce right. it. Um, so publicly announcing to everybody in your church. Right. How far you've gone with somebody that is not healthy at all. Why, no. why would, but there doesn't seem to even be a discussion being had about how to best handle this because boys in your youth group, they need a male mentor that's going to tell them what not to watch online. That is something that right. does need to happen. Um, and, and again, you can tell that young boy not to watch things all day long and you can tell him why, but if he is not saved, it's not going to do you a lick of good. You're just going to be putting legalism on. So it always comes back to me in my mind right. to the gospel, but these kids have questions and they can't sit throughout youth group and ask a million questions. And your youth pastor is one person. If you have it's a couple dozen kids, yes, it is embarrassing. And it's super embarrassing. How many kids turn it off yes. because they're just like, oh, I'm embarrassed. I'm uncomfortable. I'm just going to. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to have this conversation with you here now. Nope. Homeschool kids are a little different. Um, they've probably already done like anatomy and stuff at the age of 12 with their parents. And so they're just, we, we live in a different kind of household. Okay. Here's the problem with my household. <laughs> just to give everybody a little bit more information than they already don't have. Um, when you work, when you live with somebody who works in the medical field, your um, conversations about body parts are different because it's a science thing rather than um, an ew, gross, don't talk about that kind of thing. So in this household, we have had to make a conscious effort when discussing certain things to make sure that we're not discussing certain things in front of Kaylee (laughs) because my husband, bless his sweet little heart, has to see these things every day. Like it's a part of his job. Uh, Mm -hmm. Most of the time he works in the NICU, which means he's going to deliveries each day. I just want you guys to remember that. My husband, every day, or actually it's nighttime, but he currently his um his record is seven deliveries in one night seven holy moly seven deliveries that's crazy. so 
what he does because he's adorable is he hides in the corner and doesn't watch anything until it's his turn to actually have to do what he's supposed to be doing as respiratory therapist. So he doesn't look or anything, but I mean, I'm just saying like, this is part of his job. Sometimes he works in the mm. ER. Sometimes he works in the adult yeah. side. It's different whenever you're um, dealing with body parts, it's a little bit more cold and a little bit more uh, detached from mm -hmm. the conversation we're having now. So whenever it comes time for Kaylee to have to learn about these things, I've already told him that he gets to have that conversation. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't think I'm still like, I'm still like, you know, thank you. Um, but our, the adults, your parents should be having this conversation, but if you're in a youth group and you've got these kids all there on a Wednesday, it, this, I just, I can't see a point where this needs to be your main focus right. instead of the gospel. If you're not teaching exegetically as a youth pastor, you should know that that's something you can do. You can do that as a youth pastor. And because It'll you bring up. that up. Yeah, that, exactly. The topic's going to come up if you're preaching ex exegetically. You are going to have plenty of times to see, okay, here in scripture, we see that we are to remain pure until marriage. Okay, so what does that mean? But you're surrounding it by the context of why. Yes. Why are we staying pure until we're married? And then you're also adding in the grace of the cross so that when somebody does mess up, when somebody does walk into your church and they've already been there, done that, they've got it all, the checklist done, you know, they can sit and listen to you and they may feel guilt and they may feel remorse over their sin, but that's a good thing. The Holy Spirit can move in that. He can change that person. He can give them a new heart. He can, you know, that's, but you're preaching the gospel, you're preaching grace and you're preaching the, the, um, standards that we find in scripture that are laid out for us in scripture. So yeah. it's not just the works. It's not just one thing. You have to remain pure. If you don't, then you're dirty. Right. As opposed to preaching like the whole totality of the gospel and our sin and our fallenness and our humanness and why the cross is such good news and all of that. And then how we, how God sanctifies us, our walk yeah. with Christ talking about that. That, that is so important. I, th I just think if you can, get a hold of that in a church. If you can get a hold of that as parents, if you can understand that there is a way to do this biblically, then mm. this purity culture won't be necessary. The only reason this whole purity culture thing came about was because of the large amount of false converts in the church, because mm. of the things like you mentioned in, in our interview in the very first, the very beginning, that there was literally people misbehaving in the church building unrepentantly. Yeah. That's that's why we had this whole church purity movement, because rather than actually addressing the the actual disease, they wanted to address the symptoms and the symptoms of a fallen heart is that you're going to give in to your desires. That is mm -hmm. you, you. We all have this sort of weird expectation as believers that we want to force everyone around us to behave in a certain way that, that they're not going to do unless they really just want to fool you. And they might even get fooled themselves into thinking that they're they're genuine, e e just simply because of their actions, simply because they were able to. And that's why the thought thing is there, by the way, in case anybody is wondering why God would be so severe as to hold you accountable for even your thoughts. It's because it's not, per it's not, it's not possible for you. It is not physically possible for you as a fallen lost person to beat sin. You are a slave to sin. That's mm -hmm. just the fact of the world. You may not be a slave to the same kind of sin as somebody else is. There may be somebody out there that is completely and totally fine, not thinking about anything inappropriate, but they might just be completely and totally slave to gossip or um, pineapple pizza. I mean, there's all kinds of sin out there. There's lots of things that people can get um, involved in. But if you can recognize this as the actual gospel issue that it is, then this becomes something completely different. And then when your youth member comes to you and they say, I, I had a thought that I shouldn't have had. I saw a, a girl and she was wearing something and I thought a thought that I shouldn't have. You as a youth pastor can look at that as fruit of their salvation. But they have come to you in repentance and said, I need prayer because I'm struggling with this and I don't want to struggle with it. You, you guys, sin is done in the dark, right? Like lost people, just like with what happened to you, you didn't even sin. There was nothing that you did wrong. In fact, if anything, somebody should have gone to jail. Um, it makes me It makes me want to be a vigilante when I hear things like that and I want to put on a Batman suit and it would probably, okay, probably be a squirrel man suit, a squirrel woman suit. Wow. We're developed. We're, we're, we're developing here. Um, and I want to go and I want to attack some people with um, guns and stuff. Um, but don't take me off of, off the internet. Sorry, YouTube. Uh, but if, if somebody is, you know, they have done, they've done something that, that's sinful or whatever it is, and they're, they're not going to come and admit it willingly. You have to pull it out of them. You're going to have to drag it out of them if they're lost because Lost people don't want to admit to sin, especially not if you're telling them that their sin means they're not saved and not going to be right. saved. It, well, I had a girl tell me, happen. I had a girl tell me that um, her, uh, her purity was tied to whether or not she got to heaven. Oh. Oh, and goodness. I was like, what? So yeah. like, if she didn't remain pure, 
then she like was just lost. She wasn't, she wasn't going to make it. That's that's the unpardonable sin. Now we understand. Got it. Cool. Mm -hmm. And what you said earlier, I think that we should touch on a little bit too about uh, why it's so important, why it's so important to teach through scripture and exegetically talk to these kids and teach them theology, teach them doctrine Mm -hmm. is because when you have moments like that, where a boy says, I saw a girl wearing this, um, those kinds of moments are important for us to address too, because what is this? Is it a tank top? Is it shorts? Because they're hot. Is it flip flops mm-hmm. or were they wearing like a swimsuit because they were at the lake and they were swimming in the lake. And so like, that's, that's another really good conversation that maybe we can touch on here in a little bit too, because yes. um, holding boys responsible, regardless of if the girl is immodest or not, mm-hmm. is yes. something that is totally overlooked in, mm-hmm. in the church, totally overlooked. We yeah. see it with pastors all the time. There was just another scandal where the pastor abused women inside of the church. And what did he get? Oh, he got a slap on the hand. Mm. Mm-mm. It was an ARC church, by the way, just uh, so everybody's aware. He got a slap wow. on the hand and guess what? He got moved to a different church Mm-mm. and all those girls are suffering now. That is Do unacceptable. Wearing unacceptable clothing inside of the church. Doesn't no, matter. but I guarantee you that they feel like their worth is gone now. Oh yeah. Because are because of all of because we're just taught that that's where our worth is that's where you know we're, we're bred we're made to grow up and be wives and mm-hmm. breed and make babies and take care of those babies and that's our value is that our yeah. purity we must stay pure until we get to this point and then once we get to this point it's our job to be obedient wives and bear children and be at home and like instead of teaching women that our value is in christ first our right. value is in christ first and foremost like that should be what's being that's taught it. not everything else that comes later that we learn about in grace and truth and knowledge. This is so important. If you are putting all of the focus on your flesh, on your body, if you're telling girls the only value that they have is in this one thing, then you are essentially creating a second class of of Christians. Something that Paul Mm -hmm. specifically does not do. He specifically says that there is no longer male or female. What he means by that, by the way, is not that there's not scientifically now a male or female. Um, Genders are a thing. I hate to tell you Mm -hmm. 21st century weirdness that is just constant. No, gender is a thing. And Paul is not saying that there's not such a thing as a gender. But what he's saying is that there's no longer a distinction there. So if, Mm -hmm. if the only group of people in church that are hearing that your purity is the only thing that matters, your purity is where your value is, then where is the value in what what happens to a man in his body and what he does? That that shouldn't be a separation. There is no difference whenever it comes to our value. Whether you are a male or a female or a Jew or a Greek, either way, it does not matter what you are or where you are or how sinful or pure, whatever you want to say, whatever you've done, it doesn't matter. The only good thing in any of us is Christ. That is it. Right. There is nothing else to to redeem us. That's there. It doesn't matter how often or how very few times that you have slipped. That that changes nothing in the grand scheme of things. Your value is not ever going to be in you. And so to hear these poor women that were told that their only value is in this, this is why feminism festers in churches. Because when right. you are told by one group of people, and, and just in case y'all were wondering, this happens in the Reformed world. The pastor that I mentioned at the beginning of this is a so-called Reformed pastor. And I have seen him use language where he is telling men that they need to conquer women, That's conquer disgusting. their bodies, conquer them. And, and they, women need to submit. And, and even if they're not wanting to, or not willing in the moment, they need to do it anyways, because it is their job to submit. First of all, listen, let me, I'm going to get out the mom hand here. Okay. I'm get getting it. out the mom hand. If you are not watching this on YouTube, then you can't see the mom hand. But if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. The mom hand is out here. And I'm gonna tell you what, right now, that is not what scripture teaches us. Yes. As women, we are supposed to be submissive men also, by the way, are supposed to be submissive, just not to the wives. But what scripture specifically says is that the husband's body belongs to the wife and the wife's body belongs to the husband. And that if you separate, you can choose to do so. Like, and by separate, what they mean is have a little time where you're not going to go down that road, right? That's something that you're capable of doing throughout. Like scripture literally says, if you guys decide that you want to take a little break, that you can do that. Um, Mm -hmm. So there is absolutely nowhere in scripture where it says that as women, this is our only, that that is nonsense. This is absolutely, what about the women who can't? I can't have any more children. If that's my only value is the ability to have children, I have lost all value because I'm not capable of it any longer. Like whatever happened, whatever went wrong with Kaylee, I can't, I can't have any more. Um, That does feel a lot like I have less value than the the moms that have like eight kids. It is tough to hear this nonsense, even knowing that it's nonsense to hear that our only value as women is is to be pure and and have babies. And think about the repercussions of a woman who goes into a marriage. Because I'll tell you firsthand, they're heavy. Going into a marriage, understanding that I had messed up and I was no longer pure and hearing that I have to submit now sexually to my husband in all things, no matter what, because he is the head of my family and I am the submissive wife. That puts so much 
fear in mm-hmm. me. And it caused such a rift in Adam and I's marriage for so long because I did not understand what my role really, really was. All I knew was that I was supposed to submit. That's yeah. all I knew. And it wasn't submit in any other way other than sexually. Yeah, that's what they're talking that's, about. That's what's so disturbing to me. Yeah. What? what so why? that's my job. My job is to be a slave and to bear mm-hmm. children and to clean the house and to submit and if you whatever don't, he says. You don't have any value if you don't do that. Right. So your value right, well, is in this. Yeah. You are. Also, you, you have nothing. You're told to work, you know, diligently for the Lord. So, I mean, if you're not, then then you're also not being diligent. No, 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 no. Like, back it all up. This is nonsense. Our full and complete role as human beings, the reason we exist is to glorify God and to make him known. Right. The blessing of having a marriage where you are able to come together with your spouse is just that. It is a blessing that we don't deserve. It is not something that should be demanded or commanded or even something that you would teach in a reformed church that you should conquer your wife, that if she's not okay. submitting in this area, the elders should be called. This is this is where it becomes abusive. And we see this mm-hmm. happening in churches, irregardless of what the doctrinal um, background is. This happens in churches where purity is not taught at the very beginning, like you've, you've managed to do in such a simple way as an attribute of God, because it is an attribute of God. And when you see it like that, then you know, there, there's until I get to heaven, I'm not going to have that in perfection. I'm not. Right. If you expect perfection out of yourself, and you you know this, any mom probably is going to understand. We go to bed at night, no matter how hard we've worked, no matter how hard we've tried, we go to bed at night with like a million regrets. I guarantee you, mm-hmm. husbands, if you're listening to this, that your wife goes to bed every night thinking I could have done better. I could have loved them better. I could have spent more time focusing on them. Did I give them enough eye contact? Like that's my number one concern every night is did I put my phone down every single time she came to talk to me? Because right. I don't want to look at my phone while she's trying to tell me something. Did I do that right. enough? Did I spend enough? I wish I had played more board games or whatever it is. Like we go to bed with a lot of, a lot of regrets because we're not going to be perfect. And we're very hard on ourselves as women. We don't need anybody else really to be hard on us for us because we do a right. really good job of that already. But this is the problem. We're coming to this with the expectation of perfection. And I, when I say we, I mean like the, the purity culture is coming to the table, right. whether you're talking about young women or marriage or whatever it is. They're coming to the table with the idea that young girls are going to have to be perfect in their purity and that that's somehow possible. And it's not, it's not possible. So let's talk about this one story that I heard then, because you mentioned coming to perfection, right? So I, Mm -hmm. one of the ladies that I've, I've been able to talk to on TikTok, she shared her story because I put out that video and she said she was able to attain this perfection. She went through all of it, pure, made it to marriage, got married, and it was told to her and her church. Um, hopefully I don't botch this. If I do, Jenna, you can yell at me later. Um, that, that because she did all the steps, right, that, that meant that God was going to bless this marriage, that he was going to just bless the marriage. It was going to be a great marriage. Um, they ended up divorced. Oh my goodness. And so she was left feeling like, what? Like my church told me that if I did it perfectly, that I would have this great marriage. And now he's left me. Now what do I do? So obviously like, so where's the blame in that? I, I mean, I, I can only assume that it goes here. I must have done something wrong. I must have not been perfect because now my marriage has failed and now I don't know what to do. And Um, you've now actually, since you were married, you're you're not starting out fresh from ground zero. So you've been with your husband. Now, where do you go from there? Because you're not starting out a next relationship pure or whatever you want to call it. That, That is so sad to me that a woman would be told that. And doesn't it sound awfully familiar to... God wants you happy, healthy, and wealthy. And if you're still sick, even though God wants you healthy, it's your fault. You've done something faith. wrong. You don't have enough. Faith. It's not God. So it must be you. You've done something wrong. Um, right. Or, or perhaps just, just an idea here that I'm just, I'm just throwing out some stuff. See what you guys think, you know, pick it up. I don't know. Throw it away. I don't care either way. Maybe just possibly um, we are all sinful, wretched human beings. And there's no mm-hmm. such thing as a perfect marriage. That does not exist except for mine. Mine happens to be perfect. But everybody else's is probably not going to be perfect. I'm kidding you because I'm involved in the marriage, which makes it not perfect. Um, uh. I happen to have an amazing husband who is incredible and I love him to death. And he is he is absolutely amazing. You guys, this poor man spent the whole day today out with Kaylee while I was um, in too much pain to leave the house. And he took her shopping for a dress to go to a wedding tomorrow. He took oh. my sweet little girl. Yeah. Um, so I do have a, an amazing husband. He's not perfect, um, but he is. He's pretty amazing, but there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. And when you're brought into a marriage, this is a personal example. So you guys already know, I I wasn't actually raised in a Christian church. I didn't start hearing the purity culture until I was 14. And, um, I had, I had already spent the majority of my childhood watching men come and go in in the house. It wasn't, it wasn't anything odd for there to be boys sleeping in my sister's room. 
that's something that she she had boys stay the night and stuff like that boyfriends stay the night obviously um if there was a boy within a mile of me they would die so i did not have boys staying the night with me when i was 14 my sister was very very uh overprotective but i watched that and it seemed normal that was my normal when i started going to church my normal was something that the purity culture looked down on really badly. So I would say things not realizing that the things that I was saying were, um, you know, anathema to the purity culture. And it was just normal to me. This was just the way I was raised. I don't know why you guys are all making such a fuss. Boys stay the night at our house all the time. What are you talking about? That was not the right thing to say. It was not the right thing to say. Nope. Mm-mm, should not have said that. So those kind of things are, um, th- th- that's sort of like the, the way that I learned about purity culture. Right. So it, it came down the road to me in a really, really weird way. Um, it wasn't until I was faced with that expectation that I found that expectation to be a problem. I didn't have any issues. Like I already mentioned, I really, until I was like 16, I thought boys were gross, but it was at that point where I was going to youth and these things were constantly being discussed things that I hadn't thought about because it wasn't ever put in front of my face. And it wasn't until I was in church that I was being told about certain behaviors that apparently certain things that sometimes women could do. I didn't know that that was a thing that existed until I went to church and a youth leader told me not to do those things. And I didn't know that those were things that people did. And also a gross was all my response was, why are you telling me about this? This is gross. Can we please go play um, air hockey? Right. Because um, you, you're, you're like 80. I don't know. They're probably like 25, but anyways, um, but my husband had a completely different, like a whole different lifestyle of all of this. By the time I got to the purity culture, you know, I had been raised by a feminist and our house was um, not the same. My husband, on the other hand, had his whole childhood basically been told that this marital act was the worst thing in the world. Just, just like we've, we've heard from all the women that, that stitched your video. It's the most, it's the most horrible thing in the world that you can do and they'll disown you and you'll go to hell. And, um, there's, there's nothing else to it. You need to just date girls and don't get too serious date around. Don't definitely don't get, this is the worst part. Purity culture mixed with the fact that you're not supposed to get married. That happens a lot. Don't get married young. No, no, no. Stay pure, but go to college first. Spend the first four years of your adulthood being pure in college with absolutely nobody watching what you're doing, nobody right. actually paying attention. That's why kids go to college and they stop going to church because they're like, oh, yep. wait, I don't have to listen to you. I can do whatever I want here at this college where nobody is holding me accountable. It makes no sense. So at 19, my husband and I got married. We were like, nope, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, that doesn't sound like fun. I don't think we'll be waiting four years. But we got married really, really young. And even then after getting married, that opinion that was so drilled into his mind that this was bad, this was evil, wicked. It's like, it's like the whole thing with money or guns. People say guns are evil. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. I know that's like a mm-hmm. cliche, but it's a true one. Um, money is not right. the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not even being explained correctly when it's being talked about in ways that it shouldn't even be talked about. He, he came into our marriage with this baggage of being told his whole life that you're going to get a disease and die or, or something horrible, you know, like all these terrible things. And it affected, it affected the first few years of our marriage in a way that I couldn't possibly understand. I had no idea what on earth he was going through because I didn't go through it. By the time I heard this stuff, I was like, you guys don't know what the real world is like. Y'all are living in a fantasy. The real world's not like this. Okay. I'd already seen the real world and the real world, even if I didn't want to be active in that, that kind of lifestyle, it was what most people were doing. You cute little Christians just didn't understand the real world, but I didn't understand what my husband was going through and and the pain that that caused and how difficult it made intimacy whenever you're told that being intimate with your spouse is wrong. And I, I mean, I've heard from other people even that think the same way. It's still difficult for them. They're still struggling with that. Even after a decade or so, it's still in the back of their mind. This is, this is bad. This is wrong. You can't, you can't enjoy your marriage whatsoever, but there's, so there's abuse on both sides then, right? So we see Mm -hmm. abuse of young girls beforehand and then they're, continue to be abuse after the fact. Yeah. We, we don't just get it from the church. There's social media now where right. it, it, and it became a big thing a while ago. I won't use the, the, the language that's used, but there's a specific phrase of shaming. You're not supposed to shame people, which took things into a ridiculous realm where women were supposed to brag about their behavior on social media because it, it, right. you, you couldn't shame them. So there's a balance that's off, right? Like we see it in both directions. But abuse isn't just coming from the church. It's coming from social media. And there's consequences of both sides of this. Like you mentioned it at the beginning of this conversation, that there's there's really two ways to go here. You can ignore it, which apparently youth, youth pastors are doing for boys, mm-hmm. which is ridiculous um, mm-hmm. to, to me. I don't, I don't understand. If you've got a boy that's saved, my goodness, take him under your wing and help him because one day he will be a husband 
and he needs to learn how to be a husband. I don't understand right. ignoring it. That that is that is weird to me. No, no, no. no. That that boy is gonna he's gonna marry somebody, and he might marry right. your daughter. So maybe you should probably try to teach him how to behave like um, a man. But anyways, there are consequences both sides, and social media plays into this quite a bit. So what do you what do you see about about that? Oh man, there's so much on social media. You mm-hmm. either run into the legalism, right? Like mm-hmm. super hyper legalist, uh, everything is wrong. Uh, like you can't do anything right. Um, or you run into the really liberal avenue as well. There's not really anything in the middle that's just like strictly biblical. <laughs> so it's either like nothing matters. So you do whatever you want. You make yourself happy. Nobody can tell you what to do. It's your, my body, my choice, um, right. if you will. Um, everything is just, everything's okay. Nothing is taboo. Nothing's off limits. Or it's super legalist. So, oh my gosh, she wore a tank top. That must mean that she is Simple. that. No, like don't go near her. Or um I mean, there's, there's hardly anybody like in the center of it. Like there's hardly yeah. anybody that's like the voice of reason. Right. right. Uh, and when you do hear them, they're not very popular. Right. True. Cause either side I mean, likes everybody. That. Loves, everybody, if, if everybody seems to be on one side or the other and True. they've got oh, the legalists have a lot of people on their side and the liberal side has a lot of people on their side as well. So when you're in the middle, you get hate from both of those guys. Yeah. So it's pretty, and it's not comfortable. It's, it's not comfortable. No, but don't worry. All fun. of your hate mail is going to be read. By Clementine, my golden doodle. Oh, I can't been, actually. Read. I've been forwarding it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So feel free to send the hate mail if you're on one side or the other okay. of this. And um, and if it's if it's nice, I'll respond. If you if you if you genuinely like the one particular person that was all like liar, I'm not going to respond to that. I just deleted your comment because it's not helpful. It's not edifying for anybody for you to just be like you're a liar. No, um, no. But that is a thing that did happen um, on YouTube. Somebody was like, you're a liar. Where's your scriptural citation? Um. Oh my you're goodness. going to have to be a little bit more specific. This is a two hour long episode that you're commenting on. But uh, <laughs> uh, if you, if you do want to Everybody. send me hate mail, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it definitely gets, it gets read. It might not, I'm, I'm not going to respond if it's nonsense. Cause I've been doing this for too long and I can see the difference between somebody who genuinely wants to engage and somebody who actually just wants to um, bash you full of hate and right. ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, nope. No. Time for that. But there I are two sides of that. this. There's really just two sides. And I wrote an article about this like a really, really long time ago about balance and how difficult it was mm-hmm. in, in your walk and in sanctification and through like learning about scripture to stay balanced on subjects because um, mm-hmm. we, we do tend to like feel passionately about one way or the other. It's kind of like, uh, and this is a weird example, but it is one that that I, I constantly remember, especially whenever it comes to these kind of things. Somebody once told me that you shouldn't say, oh my goodness, because it's the same as, as um, blaspheming the name of God. Yep. And uh, no, it's You're not. just switching not. the word, but that's what you really mean. You really mean G-O-D. No, I don't. That's why I'm not saying yeah. that. If I wanted to say it, I would say it. But right. see, that's the imbalance that people have. You know, like they're, they're like, not only am I going mm-hmm. to behave, but I'm going to be extra behavior. I'm going to behave like no one's ever behaved before. And that's where you get like the legalistic ones that are all like, well, she's wearing yeah. flip flops and this is church. You shouldn't wear flip flops because those are a thing. Um, or vice versa. You get the people who are like, I can wear whatever I want. And if you don't like mm-hmm. it, you shouldn't look. But there is a middle ground there where you can, if somebody, because sometimes people actually do wear clothes to church that are not appropriate. If that person is a member of that church and they are saved and they show fruit and all that good stuff, then there's nothing wrong with an elder lovingly suggesting that that, that outfit, maybe if it's really, really low cut or your skirt is, um, fingertip used to be a thing, right? I am so uncomfortable with clothes that are fingertip length. I, I, I absolutely know, absolutely not, cannot go out of the house in, in things that are like fingertip, fingertip. I, I just, I constantly like, oh man, um, this is uncomfortable. It's, it's a hundred degrees out. But I'm still going to have to wear shorts that at least are, you know, like really close to my knees. And that's just a comfort thing because, by the way, my thighs, uh, hashtag age is a thing. And um, so is cellulite. So <laughs> sometimes we want to cover that. Um, <laughs> but anyways, all that, like, you know, long story short, short story long. They, there, there is a point where the balance is needed. And sometimes that particular person is unaware that... that Look, okay, here, listen, if you guys are listening to this and you're a man, you may not be aware of this, but there's a thing that happens where like you're wearing um, a, a, ca- what, a cameo or something underneath there. They, you know, they make shirts that go underneath shirts and, and that might sound right. like a stupid thing, but the shirts that go underneath shirts are there so that like cleavage doesn't show and they don't always stay where they're supposed to stay. The lady might not even be trying to be, she might just, just be a, 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 one of those unfortunate ladies that has that problem because she, she has that problem. So it might not even be that right. she was trying to be inappropriate, but if somebody is repeatedly wearing inappropriate clothes. You know what might be a really good idea? Sister, do you do you need, can I take you shopping? Maybe she actually doesn't have clothes. Like it, it never occurs right. to people that there are people out there so poor in this country. I know it's weird to think about in the West, but there really are ladies out there who don't have any other clothes to wear. And they think, okay, either I can wear clothes from what before I was saved and go to church or I can miss church and they don't know what to do. Right. It, it might be a good idea before you assume 
to actually ask some questions. Don't just assume you know. Assumption is never assumption is never the way we want to go. Yeah, I have people assume stuff about me every single day, and it is the most. Is it because <laughs> is it tiring for everybody to assume that you're TikTok famous? It must be really tiring <laughs> for everybody to assume that you're as amazing as you seem. I, I bet that's exhausting. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry that you have to go through that. But you should be less awesome, so funny. and then that wouldn't happen. <laughs> they don't think I'm so awesome. I'm, I'm remember I'm the balance, so I'm I'm not like saying that God told me in every single video. And I'm also not being like, you can believe when whoever and get to heaven. Um, I've got, I've got that balance. So right I'm not as popular as those two camps. And they don't really <laughs> hate on each other. That's the weird thing to me. They don't particularly hate on each other, but they sure will hate on you. Like that, that is so strange to me. Like if you go to one of the extremes of these, they tend to ignore one another. They're just like, well, obviously you're wrong. And I don't really care. But if you happen to have a balanced view of things, suddenly you're using like logic and reason in scripture. And nobody likes you. It's so weird oh, to me no. to see. Yeah, they're like, absolutely not. I think not. Oh, wait, you mean to tell me that uh, you don't believe, you don't agree with either one of us? So all of a sudden they're teaming up on you. There's two sides. Uh-huh. And they're like, finally, something we agree on. That, by the way, happens about anchovies. Like us people who know the truth about pineapple pizza and those people who don't know the truth about pineapple pizza, we will team up whenever um, you start putting anchovies on things. It's the only time we go to war together, but we will do it. Needed. <laughs> Very needed. <laughs> it is. It's true. It's true. But there is a balance. So help us with the balance here. Like, give, give us a little bit of an example because there does have there is a tendency from the extreme, mm-hmm. the extreme um, legalistics to forget that there's such a thing as liberty and that if you're comfortable wearing flip flops, you should be able to wear flip flops. If you feel yeah. like you should be that, that's weird. That's a weird thing. No, don't do that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop telling people not to right. wear open toed shoes because some of us, I'm not pointing any fingers, but some of us have really fat feet. And it's difficult to wear high heels that are close to talking about me. Just, <laughs> just a I'm the one who has fat feet. Do you have fat feet too? Why do they make heels like that? Why do I, all I don't my know. heels come to a point? Why, why? Not all of our toes come to a point. I'm just no trying to take some of the heat off of you so that they didn't oh, think that you. you were talking about yourself. Oh, I appreciate that. Are you saying that you, in fact, do not have fat feet? Because I have fat feet. No, all my toes are the same very, spot. I have very, like, bad feet. Like, I have cracked oh. feet. They're pretty oh, bad. No. So you can't yeah. particularly wear certain shoes either. Why can't no, we, just I can't. we have liberty in Christ to wear whatever shoes we want to wear. Unless the shoes have like bad yeah. language on them. Is that a thing? Yeah. It, okay, probably. Though. There's like the Satan shoes. <laughs> so we shouldn't be wearing those. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> Why is that a thing? You haven't heard about that? Oh, it was huge just so a while weird. ago. Oh it's no. Fine. It's fine. I'm gonna I mean it's not fine, but <laughs> it's a thing that exists though. Yeah, just look like, them up. Yeah. It's just what we would up. expect it's from the world, okay? We expect the world. We can't ask the world to be pure. But probably as Christians, yeah. we shouldn't be wearing those to church. And then there's the other side that says, um, don't even wear shoes to church. It's, I hope that's not a thing. That's probably a thing. Um, most of the colds that you catch, you catch through your feet. You should just know that. Uh, germs, they they can enter your body through your feet. Don't do that. Don't wear no shoes. Oh, my goodness. If somebody does wear no shoes, though, assume that they probably can't afford them. Don't make assumptions. We've gotten off track here. How, how do you how do you handle yeah, the balance? Okay. What, what, do we, what do we do here? Help us out. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm reminded again of, like, the conversation of, that you that you kind of like laid out of like the boy who was like I saw this girl wearing a tank top and you know is it necessarily wrong that that girl's wearing a tank top so what is understanding what Christian liberty is and understanding that um we are inherently responsible for our own thoughts and actions somebody else is not responsible for us sitting Mm -hmm. right like and we're told not to cause somebody else to stumble too so there is that we have but we have to understand that if somebody's not understanding that um then how are they going to know you know so the balance really comes in, in what we've been talking about is just making sure that we're properly exegeting scripture, that we're properly mentoring those that are younger than us that are coming up after us, that we're forming relationships in the body of Christ with people so that we're able to have these hard conversations. Because yeah. in this world that we live in today, it's so online too. Everything's online. Everything We can sit in our houses and watch church. We, we only go for just a minute and then we leave. Nobody's really interested in forming relationships and relationship is huge. Relationship is very big. It should be a very big part of our of our walk with Christ is relationship with fellow believers. And when we're forming those relationships, we're able to correct and we're able to have hard conversations um, with those that maybe don't know, or maybe those that are in rebellion. Somebody that's saying, you know what, I can wear whatever I want and I'm going to wear this really low cut shirt, or I am going to wear these short shorts because this is what I'm comfortable in. And so I'm going to wear it. And if you have a problem, then pluck your eye out. I've heard that so many times. Oh yeah. And it's just wrong. It's just so wrong. You know, but if you're Um, unsaved and this is, this is so important. You mentioned this already. If you're if if you're trying to explain to somebody why they shouldn't be doing that and and they're not they've, they've never heard this before, it's not gonna make any sense. It's just to give you guys a really great example. I think I've told this story before on air, but uh, when my husband and I were dating, I already mentioned to you guys that like okay, I was raised in a feminist church, a feminist house. Um, I had absolutely no uh, idea that that 
skirts, you know, being a certain length were a problem. And I had a mini skirt. I just had one. I had this one little mini skirt. I thought it was super cute. And um, it was not, it wasn't cute. Just in case you guys were wondering, it was really ugly, but I thought it was cute. I thought it looked cute in it. And my amazing husband, he comes to pick me up at, to go on a date. And I at least knew not to wear that skirt to church, right? Like I, I knew, and I guess I say it's a mini skirt, but it was definitely finger length. Uh, Cause again, my thighs, not a thing that I ever wanted to show anybody, um, but it, it was still too short. It was still too short of a, of a skirt. And he says, Dude, I'm not taking you to the movies like that. Go, go put on something else. And my in, immediate response is, excuse you. I can wear whatever I am. I, I am a adult. Of course I was not actually an adult, but I said, it. I was, I'm an adult and I wear whatever I want. And he said, he just looked at me so serious, looked me dead in the face. And he said, you are already beautiful. You do not need to wear that to look beautiful. And I turned around and I put on a, I put on a different skirt and it never had occurred to me before. It had never occurred to me before to think about it in that way, that, that I was doing that. I was wearing certain clothes because it made me feel valuable. I, that mm -hmm. attention that those clothes were giving me was how I was achieving my opinion of being valuable. And when somebody said to me, you have value intrinsically, you don't need to look a certain way. This goes both ways. When somebody tells you that your only value is in covering up your whole body and making sure that you don't do anything inappropriate, it's the same feeling as whenever somebody tells you your only value is in showing off what you've got. Neither right. of those are true. And until right. somebody tells these girls this in a loving way, rather than gossiping or accusing or being rude mm -hmm. and, and hateful about it, just saying you are already beautiful. You don't need to wear that. It changes. Right. It, it's possible that they've never heard that before. So I hadn't. I, I well, wasn't even thinking about us. it. Yeah. Culture tells us all the time what's what's good looking, yep. what's not, how we should be looking, you know, and yep. and it's whether there's like all the movements saying that everybody is beautiful and whatnot, you know, you do see some of that, but the majority of it, it that's not the loudest voice out there telling women right. where their value is. The loudest voice yeah. out there telling women where their value is and what they're is and what they're wearing, their makeup you know, they're jewelry, or no they're, makeup. They're, yeah. Or no makeup. Yeah. yeah like, there, like there's both sides of it. There. Well, if you wear makeup at all, you're just trying to, you know, whatever it is, if you're, if your beauty is based on an outward extent, then you've already missed the point because beauty is right. arbitrary. It's, it's a completely arbitrary opinion. Some people absolutely love sunrises and sunsets. Other people think that the sun is really annoying and bright and they prefer to see stars. Okay. I'm just saying like <laughs> beauty is arbitrary. Everybody has a different opinion. But if you're, if you're a young girl and you've never been told that your beauty doesn't come from the outside, comes from who you are on the inside, that's not going to make any sense. And e even if you're in a church that's telling you to be pure, that purity is going to be what you attach your sense of beauty to. And when you mm -hmm. lose it, like what happened to you, the imbalance is going to show. It's going to show. So I just wasn't going to mention that really quickly, um, but you continue with your thought. I just wanted to mention like, yeah, I, I was that girl. I was that girl that was like, don't tell me what to wear until someone yeah. explained it to me in the most basic way possible. How do we get to the point where we are sharing the grace of God for this? Because there's also an imbalance of that where people don't want to actually address the sin because mm -hmm. there, there is, um, if you're a born again believer and, and you are in sin, then that does need to be addressed, right? That is, that is something that we yeah. want. We don't want to ignore that. But a lot of times the problem is actually the way that it's happening. So how do we, um, how do we bring the grace of God into this? Cause I know I've said it a million times but as those who follow the doctrines of grace, oughtn't we be gracious maybe i think we need to stop and think before we go ahead and pass judgment on somebody first and foremost oh, let's let's stop time. <laughs> holy moly like instead of just immediately forming an assumption about somebody stop and think and start a conversation start a conversation with them you know you can't extend grace if you're constantly on guard to find something wrong somewhere yep. right mm -hmm. you cannot extend grace if you're constantly like there's some, there's gotta be something wrong. There's gotta be something wrong here. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. you have to have these conversations and you have to remember that we are called to love and that, that love, even, even if you're having to tell somebody something that is hard to hear, mm -hmm. it should be coded in love. Yeah. It should, it shouldn't come across as a harsh um, thing. I mean, it's going to come across harsh anyway, when you're saying something that they think you're judging, that you're judging them. Right. Um, right. But the way but you can you make it, it worse, you can, and you, you can say it in a more kind way. And if you can't, then, d then don't say anything, please yes. let Thank somebody you. else say it. Yes. Because and if, if you, you cannot, can, you need yeah. to address that, like address in your, your own life. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Take us, take a step and, back and figure out why it is happens. that you can't. 
it happens so much too. I see it so much and I've probably been guilty of it. I mean, I know that we all have been guilty of it at times. Um, so recognizing that, recognizing yeah. that, you know what, if I can't stop for a second and think about this and then address it in love, address it kindly, mm-hmm. address it covered in grace, the grace, the same grace that was extended to you, a sinner yeah. who was just as much in sin. If you can't extend that same grace that's been extended to you, then you have no business confronting anything. None. Absolutely. Because you, you already have grow. something to work on. Yeah. Right. Work on that you need to keep growing. Keep, keep letting God sanctify you because so um, you're it, not going to do yeah. any good. You're not actually no. going to help anything. Um, this is so important. This is especially in this area because what you're dealing with, whenever you're dealing with um, whether they're younger or listen, this isn't just a young people thing. Um, I've seen some 30 year old uh, ladies in clothes that I don't even think 20 year olds should wear. Um, so it's not just a young person thing, but it's a people thing. Like it's a person thing. And it's not just mm-hmm. for girls. Okay. Um, if there's a boy at your church and his, his pants are too far down and you're seeing his underoos, then you might also have to talk to him. Now it's funny because, um, a lot of times we think of boys being, you know, like you just can roughly, roughly say to them, pull up your pants. Um, but that doesn't actually address the issue of why he's wearing his mm-hmm. pants where you can see his underoos. And I don't care how, cool you think your underwears are nobody should have to see them um but there's an issue behind that that needs to be addressed mm-hmm. and if you're so right. aggressively telling them in such a harsh way that their behavior is wrong or that they just need to repent or whatever it is that they're not going to heaven or in my case they're not going to be able to fight in the war with Jesus um if you're saying that in such an un- unloving ungracious way then you're you're not going to be the person that they come to and say you know what no. the reason i've been behaving this no. way is because there was a there was a man who did something inappropriate and i mm-hmm. can't get this out of my head. And it is, it is affecting everything about my life. And I feel like I've got no value. They're not going to come to you if you've been right. harsh and angry. And they're, they're definitely not going to feel comfortable addressing their sins in that kind of a context where we, we need to, as brothers and sisters of Christ, be able to repent to one another. Not everything. We don't like, you know, have to just spill our guts constantly. But right. if, if I've sinned against you, I need to be able to repent. And you're not going to want to do that if I've been super hateful and mean to you because I'm the one that needs to repent for being super hateful and angry. So you said something really important that I just want to hone in on really quickly. Take some time to consider why. Why are you feeling the need to correct this person? Because there is only two reasons to correct someone. The first one is that it's going to bring glory to God. And the second one is it's going to bring glory to you. Those Mm -hmm. are the only options. So if, if you're making a choice to address this with somebody, is, is it, are you stealing the glory from God when you do this? Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Are you just are you just trying to be right? Yeah. Right? Are you just right. trying to be right? And we could bring this conversation even into debates online. We could bring it everything. into any conversation yep. and everything. Are you just trying to be right? Or are you trying to bring glory to God? That's, that's perfect. Like you couldn't say it any more perfect. Uh, you need to self-evaluate. Yeah. And that's hard sometimes, but we need to learn how to do it. And mm-hmm. if it's not our place, if, if not our place, but if it's not our goal, Mm-hmm. Um, to bring God glory. If our goal is to just be right, if our goal is to embarrass, if our goal is to get attention, if our goal is to um, whatever it is, if it's anything other than bringing God glory, mm-hmm. then no, don't uh, do it. Don't do it. Yeah, seriously, it would be better for you to leave that sin alone than to mm-hmm. sin yourself. I promise you, right. there's no world in which you should sin to correct somebody else's sin. That's not. That's literally the opposite. We are told to judge with righteous judgment. And also, here's just uh, another really, really important thing. Um, there's a time and place for everything as well. So mm-hmm. um, in the front of everybody at youth is not the time or the place to correct somebody. Um, mm-hmm. Unless there are body parts showing, in which case you should definitely address that right away and, and handle that right. uh, instantly. But you're like, uh, that's that's not going to happen. Like in what world right. does somebody go to youth group with uh, literally physically showing things? Um, and I mean, like the the body parts. I'm not talking about just like your arm here. You guys know what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, unless that is happening, there is no reason for you to embarrass somebody in front of everybody unless no. you're really trying to do it, like you said, for your for your own glory. So evaluate all of these things before it happens, if you, especially if you're a leader or an elder and you may be confronted with this situation. You need to already have a thought process planned out for these things. Also, here, just a little free tip for you guys. Um, if you're a youth pastor and you're a man, Do not pull your teenage girls from your youth class to tell them about their outfits. Don't do that. You need to find a woman, an elder woman in your church, because that's not appropriate. Um, No, it's not. Don't don't spend time alone with any of your young teenage girls as as a man. I'm just saying that's just some free advice for you guys. Even if you have, um, you know, like they're just buddies of your friend's friend. I don't care. Don't don't talk to a young girl about her body. Um, Let a woman handle that. 
I'm sorry. Yeah. That might sound harsh. No, but it's your absolutely child. needs to be said. It absolutely needs to be said. Unless it is your child, you shouldn't be alone with a girl from your youth group. That's absolutely inappropriate. And people don't like that, but it's true. And it needs to be said. So I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I know that a lot of people think that it's sort of rare for um, pastor, uh, for youth pastors and youth members to get involved. But um, I, I, I have very rarely met somebody who spent a good long portion of time in churches that hasn't seen something like that happen. Um, I did, I saw it and I, I was only in youth for a few years before I was too old for it and started going to the young adult stuff. So it, I saw multiple um, pedophilial relationships happening in, in the youth with the youth teachers and the youth yeah. members. So, and it's not just men with the young girls. Uh, it happens right. with, with the wives of the youth pastors and the young boys. So in either case, don't yeah. do that. Don't allow that to yeah. happen um, because you don't know who's lost and who's saved. And sometimes it's the um, the wolves in sheep's clothing that are leading and uh, watching the chicken hen door. I think that's the expression. I'm not exactly sure. But yeah. do you notice um, how many parents send their kids to youth group and the parents don't go to church, mm-hmm. but they send their kids to youth group. Right. And um, they're sending them into the popular churches, into the churches where these things are happening. And it's the churches where we are seeing the biggest heresies put forth onto the youth. And it reminds me of the story you told me of the guy and how he was able to spread heresy so quickly is because he was teaching songs to the youth. Um, right. Ar- Aranaeus. 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 Yep. Um, and so parents are thinking they're doing such a good thing for their children by sending them to youth group because, Hey, at least they're getting morals. They're talking about things. They're, they're making my kid into a good person. I do think that this is, and there's just like you just already said, there's, there's two sides of what that, what can happen in these situations. Uh, mm-hmm. from one side of one perspective of this, it could be genuinely that they are being manipulated and controlled by this exact topic about purity and stuff like that. But on the other hand, mm-hmm. it does happen that the um, volunteers, which usually tend to be in their late teens or 20, early twenties, um, or the actual youth pastors, which tend to be in their late twenties, early thirties, they're sometimes, oftentimes, I mean, not every time, but in, especially in these bigger churches where it's easier to hide these things. I'm not saying that they are forcing themselves on anybody. I'm saying that relationships are formed inappropriately and illegally because it is illegal. In case anybody was wondering, it's still illegal, even if she's 16. Yeah. Um, right. And that, that you're not, you're not there to pay attention. So you don't even realize as a parent, you think, you think you've done this great thing because you've sent them to this place. And hopefully we're, we're finally at a place in the world where we understand that no church is safe from false converts that are going to come in and do things that they shouldn't do. Hopefully we're now in a place where we understand that because it's not just the Catholic church. It's happening in the Pentecostal churches. It's happening in the assembly of God. It's happening in the Southern Baptist church. And I just mentioned to you guys at the beginning of this episode about a church, a reformed church that is, um, it's got a lot of problems. So it doesn't matter which church you're in. If you have a teenage girl, if you have a child, you need, you need to be paying attention to these things. And if something changes in their behavior, I can't, I can't not keep saying this their behavior suddenly changes. It is most likely not because they just decided that they all of a sudden want to rebel. That is not normal. Right. If your child suddenly behaves differently, it is very possible that somebody has done something to them that they're not supposed to be doing. So that's just right. another bit that I'm going to keep repeating because it bothers me really badly that nobody noticed that for you. But we've talked a lot about how not to correct this. What is the right way to correct um, uh, uh, people maybe... Okay, let's see. We're gonna we're gonna run the gambit. I want to know how to correctly okay. correct somebody who is behaving in an impure way, somebody who okay. is teaching impurity in a bad way, teaching the purity movement stuff. How do we correct them? How do we correct our mm-hmm. kids? How do we handle other people? Because I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I am around somebody else's child and they are friends with my daughter. And I'm I'm in a position where I can pour the love of Christ out on that child. Do what, at what point do you have the um, responsibility, even mm-hmm. if that particular it's not happened to me, but in the future maybe it'll happen. I don't know. Um, you have kids way older than mine, so you'll your advice will be good for me as well. At what point do we have the um, responsibility, not the right, but the responsibility mm-hmm. for um, another another person's child if they aren't being taught in their own house? What? How do we correct all of those? <laughs> go. Okay. Ready to go. Where's it go? <laughs> you forget that my brain works very similar to your brain. So how do you <laughs> correct? <laughs> okay, so how do you correct? You started off with how do you correct um, uh, 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 things happening in church? Yes, that we started there off? are yes, there are people in church who are dressing impurely or behaving mm-hmm. impurely because, like you mentioned, okay. impurity is not just a modesty thing. They're um, 
there mm-hmm. are behaviors. Okay, here, here's just a really, right. really great example. If you hug my husband for too long, it's just I will example. punch you. I will punch you. <laughs> <laughs> that is how you correct people. That is right. Yes. <laughs> so I'll Saint Nick and just knock somebody out. Um, right. you know, Kristen and I are laughing, but seriously, if you hug my husband for too long, I'm, <laughs> honey, I'm a Christian. But if you keep this up, sorry, there's so that's Christians that throw hands, throw hands. Yes, that's right. Uh, but it is a thing that I have seen. Um, not, not in, not in any of the churches I've been to recently, but whenever I was younger, I did see this behavior where, um, women were maybe a little too touchy feely with somebody else's husband. Or I happen to know that, um, there's a particular family member who is on my husband's side that had a member of their church spending way too much time with them. And they, no matter how much they were just like, listen, my husband might be uh, gone, but he's my husband. He he travels for work. He's a truck driver. But when he comes home, you will die. So stop it. Um, but I mean, so it's both sides, right? This, this can happen. Right. Teenagers can get too feely, touchy feely at church. How do we handle that? Um, as believers, you know, if we see something like that happening, so say like the touching and stuff, and I'm a leader of the church, I'm, I'm a leader in group in the youth group, you know, I'm not the pastor, but I'm just there helping. I'm, I'm just one of the leaders. Um, what you, what you were saying earlier about, you know, women addressing girls and men addressing boys is something that's very important. Um, I think if you're seeing actual physical touching, there is a point where you can step in and say, hey, guys, like, cut it out. You know, this, this is the place, you know, it's just saying like, this isn't the place for that, you know, mm-hmm. and if they continue to do it and then, then there's conversation, obviously, to be had. If they're not going to stop if, and taking into account, are these kids believers or are they just kids that were sent by their parents? Do their parents go here? Right. If their parents go here, that's a conversation that you can have with their parents. Yep. Because it is their parents' job. If mm-hmm. if I knew that my daughter was messing around in youth group, she was being stupid, she's doing whatever, I don't even know. Um, I want a phone call. Yep. I want a phone call. Yep. Get even out of the sanctuary. Let me know. And call me. Mm-hmm. Because I'll come down there and I'll drag yeah. her out by her ear. Because I have, that's my responsibility. That's my daughter. And that's what I'm going to do. So take that into account. Do these kids go to the church? Do you know their parents? Are they acting inappropriately inside of church? Yeah, call their parents. Let their parents come and take care of it. Um, but if it's kids that don't go there, letting them know, hey, this isn't appropriate. We don't do this here. Tapping them on the shoulder quietly, you know, or yes. just like tapping them on the shoulder and be like, thank you. Ah. You don't have like, to say it in front of everybody. It doesn't need to come from the stage. Yep. There you go. There you go. It, this is why volunteers come- are a good thing. Yeah. Half sign language, you know, you can be like, right. Like just like, nobody, everybody listening has no idea what I just did, but sorry. And if um, somebody wants to hug my husband for too long and after church in the foyer, mm-hmm. um, they're going to get a tap on the shoulder from me. That's not like, hey, hi, back off. But uh, I'm going to be honest husband, with you. Um, I probably am not sanctified enough to have that conversation. I'm going to be completely honest. If this happened to me in real life, um, I'm I'm 100% not sanctified enough to have that conversation without sinning. So I would definitely have to uh, address it in a different way where um, I can let my husband know that if he doesn't say something next time, that I will misbehave. <laughs> that I'm going to be in trouble. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one. To prevent your wife oh, man. from sinning, you might want to. But luckily, like you said, um, and I'm sure your husband's like this. My husband's like this. He's not going to hug any other. <laughs> if somebody does try, and it's so cute. I love my husband so much. When, when a woman does try to come and hug him at church, and she's under the age of like 60, he turns to the side and gives him a side hug. Mm-hmm. It gives you a really good excuse to get away from the hug as quickly as possible. Right. And almost every single time, and I, it's so much fun, he gives he looks directly at me. While he's doing the side hug, like, do you, are you going to do something about, can, can, you, can you come over here, please? Can, excuse me, please, please. See your wife, can you come over here? This is awkward and uncomfortable. And, uh, and so here, yes, I come right on over and I'm like, hi, hi. I'm we, just we don't really like have to greet each other with like a holy kiss. And like, it doesn't yes. need to be a holy hug. Just because we're not greeting each other with a holy kiss doesn't mean you need to switch it. Don't touch other people's husbands. Thank you. How about that? And why? That's, that's a good solid, yeah, that's, a handshake. You can There's shake hands. Handshake. Yes. A that's good solid handshake. appropriate okay. in your conduct. <laughs> but I mean, let's take it to the next step. You said, what if? We see leaders being inappropriate. Um, I I tried to address this. I took it to the pastors because it was really inappropriate behavior, and I was ignored. So, you know, I I don't I I think that 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 should have been a good response, right? If you're seeing leaders yes. of a youth pastor. ministry, yeah. taking it to the pastor should be what you do. You okay. shouldn't have to confront that. You shouldn't have to step in between that because those are two people that are supposed to be sanctified. Mm-hmm. and on the straight and narrow, right. um, that doesn't have to be, you don't have to address that personally. You don't have to step in between that. And I don't recommend stepping in between that. Take it to a pastor. A pastor should be able to address something like that, whether yeah, it's a youth awkward. pastor 
or the head pastor, um, start with the youth pastor. If it's the youth pastor, then if they don't get a new youth pastor, get it out of the church. Right. If the pastor responds in any way other than, I mean, and, and, okay, so let's back this up a little bit so that we can, we can make room okay. for, for everything. You can't necessarily take somebody's word for it because there are people mm-hmm. out there that will actually lie. However, <laughs> it is, it is very rare that this kind of behavior is not something that isn't, you know, a part of another problem. It's very rare that somebody who is willing to do this in church has not already also done other things that the pastor can point to. A very wonderful, amazing, godly, I mean, I'm thinking of like Aaron Coates kind of a person. You're not going to find them randomly being inappropriate. There are other, there are other signs is what I'm saying, right? So there, there are other signs. Sure. But besides that, um, that particular person that is um, that has been caught, they, they need to they need to have a, an explanation for why they were where they were at and what they were doing. Also, you got cameras in a church might be a good idea. I'm just saying, like, there's no reason not to have cameras in your church. But so, if a pastor yeah. says, "Listen, this is very serious," and the member that has brought this to me is a member in good standing that I have never once seen any problems with, and they are pointing to a couple that are unmarried and have been dating for a very long time, that that's already you know, but that's already kind of pointing to the fact that it's possible she's telling the truth. And then you look mm-hmm. at the couple and you say, you know what? There are a lot of signs that this particular couple is acting impurely. Then then maybe it might be a good idea to address this with that sure. couple. Yeah. If the couple flat out says, oh no, she's lying. Um, you've got a problem because if she's lying, then she's sinning. This has to be addressed. Mm-hmm. This has to be worked through. You cannot just brush this under the carpet. If you have people sinning like that in church, we, this is the this is the problem that I'm having, right? Like, like it has to be it has to be resolved. You can't just pretend like it didn't happen. I'm not going to walk around yeah. with a camera because you're a pastor that doesn't want to address this. I'm going to go find a church yeah. where there's a pastor that wants to address it because you can't just right. ignore a member in good standing. It wasn't like you were a random stranger coming up for no mm. reason whatsoever to say right. this this truth. Like th- that's ridiculous. There was no reason to lie about that. Also, accusing somebody of lying without evidence that they are in fact lying is sin. You can't do that. <laughs> okay. It's like, oh my goodness. Bad. I'm, yeah. 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 Don't, don't. Yeah. It's, it's a whole tangent. So. <laughs> yes, it is. But taking it to the pastor, making sure he's aware yes. is a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Don't, don't step in between two people that are behaving like that. Just, to, just as like optics wise. Yeah. That's not appropriate. I mean, and if you're friends with that person, sure, you can address it at a later time too, if you wanted to do it that way. Because if if you know them, you know, and that's why we go back to like relationship being so important, you know. But if you know this person and I, I say I catch you and I say, Lauren, I caught you, you know, I saw you, you you know, my conversation with you is gonna be, look, you really need to step down. Like you don't need to be in this kind of position yep. because you obviously can't control yourself and you shouldn't be leading other kids. So that's like the kind of hard conversations that I would have with you in love. And if you are a sanctified believer, you're going to, like you said earlier, either get upset, go and pray about it and be convicted, or you're going to be convicted on the spot yeah. and be like, you know what? You're right. You know, like that. Just, I disqualified that wasn't myself at that point. You did, yeah. I've disqualified right. myself. Yeah. Th- th- does people not realize that there's such a thing as disqualification for leading? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a thing. Right. It's a biblical thing. You have to be qualified. You have to right. be qualified before you can be allowed to. And that's different than volunteering. Okay. I understand mm-hmm. being, a, being a leader, being um, like a Sunday school teacher or whatever it is. Uh, that's different than volunteering, but you know what? Volunteers need to be held up at a certain standard too. Right. And if if you happen to see somebody and they're doing that and then they don't repent to you, you need to take it to a pastor. Um, right. Because a child could walk in and see that. And if I'm a parent, let me tell you right now, I am going to be very upset if my child Especially walks in and see that. if you're preaching purity culture yes. inside a youth group. Thank you. And then the leaders are doing stuff like that. Oh, come mm-hmm. on. I can't. Double standard. Even. Yeah. What's, what, 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 this yeah. is stop. And it's almost like that's the reason. I don't know if it's for everybody, but there does feel like there's this this desire to um in in the I don't even know, like the, the pride of the flesh saying, I need everybody to think that I'm pure. So because I need everybody to think that I'm pure, I'm gonna push this purity qual this purity culture hardcore so that nobody looks behind the scenes at my impurity. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that's not the case for everybody. I do think that there are people out there who genuinely think this is important. And it's not we're not saying that it's not important. Right. to to work through this with your with your youth group. What we are saying is that if you're expecting your youth group to understand purity, um, then you might want to start with, it's an attribute of God. That's a good place to start, not don't. It's a great place to start. Around. Every time you talk about it. Yes. Every single time you talk about it. Makes sense to, um, I don't know, like teach doctrine. 
makes sense to teach the gospel to when you're talking about purity. Just yeah, or else it will make no sense to the child you're talking to. So we're not like saying at no point in time should anybody ever discuss purity. It, it's just the yeah. um the real the real issue, just to bring this around full circle, the real issue is what are you placing the value of that child on? Are you teaching this right. child that their only value is in how many works they manage to achieve? That's what, what that is. To. It is. It that is boils down, down to workspace works. salvation and just do these works and you're good, you know. When the fact of the matter is, is that no, none are good. None. Yes. No, not one. So that's it right there. That is, that and we're is elevating, that. elevating sin over sin to the mm-hmm. saying that sexual sin is a way bigger offense than gossiping or lying or slander or, you know, or pretty much everything else. You know, they don't right. put a whole lot of emphasis on those sins. It's just this sin. It's just sexuality and, and what you do here. Yeah. You know, that's not right. That's not right at all. And then you and get it's people so like that one sister who said she managed to do it perfectly and mm-hmm. um, and then got married. But nobody was pointing out to her, um, hey, by the way, if you've ever lied, then the, you, you need to repent of your sins, put your faith in Christ. Right. Uh, you, you're missing the whole gospel at that point. That that poor sweet sister spent her whole youth thinking I'm perfect. I have right. done a good job. I am, a, I am a good person because somebody convinced yeah. her that if she stayed pure, she was a good person. No, no. Yeah. No. That's not biblical. Right. And I've talked to Alexis too about this a little bit, um, about it being um, your whole identity. And so like all that pride and all that, all that as well, all that junk. And so then having to deal with all that junk too <laughs> on top of it. I yes. mean, here you are thinking that you're just so perfect and you made it and I'm just so amazing. And then to be devastated by yeah. divorce, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. I mean, even just entering in, with that perfection, you're, you'd be scared. I would think you'd be scared to lose it. Yeah. And that's where I'm, the guilt comes in for intimacy. Yeah. Because it is. It right. is a thing that happens where um, marriages struggle because one of them or both of them has been told that if you, and you guys, I, I have to just point this out really quickly. I've said it a couple of times, but just so you know, when I was told that you were not going to be able to be involved in the army of God, if you weren't pure, it was even if you were married. So the idea there was don't get married, stay single, become a monk. I don't even know what you would call somebody like that. And, um, and then a maybe, nun? maybe a nun. Yes, that's right. Like the word of faith version of a nun. And then maybe you'll get to be in the army of God. I'm pretty sure I was told to be fruitful and multiply. You can't really do that. That's commanded. Yeah. Um, so that's there are so some serious to consequences to teaching somebody that... Purity is the only thing that matters. You have to have a well balanced. So how do we correct people who are teaching this though? Like if they're a teacher and they're like, let's say somebody's in the comment section and they're saying, no, 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 purity is the most important thing to, to teach to youth. How do we correct people like that? Because they're um they're the ones that we really need to fix so so that it stops. Well, we have to remember that we can't fix them. <laughs> first and foremost. You're not gonna change anybody's mind. <laughs> You're not gonna change anybody's mind in the comment section. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. Doesn't work. Thank you. That's it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're done. Um, and let's start the emotional music because that was the perfect comment. I just think that the churches need to take this issue more seriously, and not more seriously as in like buckling down and increasing purity <laughs> culture talks. I mean, like seriously, as in there are people that this movement has absolutely devastated. If we don't understand that there are people walking into our church that have been absolutely hurt by this whole movement um, and we're not doing what we can to extend the grace mm-hmm. of God to them and say, look, that's not where your value is. Your value is in Christ. Let me tell you the gospel. Let me help you on this path. Mm-hmm. If we're not willing to do that kind of stuff, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, I mean, this I've talked to beyond just the stitches that you were able to see so many women and men. Men that regret their hand in purity culture and yeah. women that have been given up on going to church because they're just being judged, immediately being judged for either telling their story, for the clothes that they're wearing, for um, whatever, whatever it is that they failed when it comes to this whole mindset is they're just not, they don't want to go back because they don't want to sit under that judgment anymore. Right. We're not being the church if we're not helping those people. We're not being the church if we're not explaining to them, you know, correctly why yes. we keep ourselves pure why, or why it should be something that we do. And if we mess up, it's okay because there's grace that covers that. Yeah. That's there's important. an abundance of it. <laughs> yeah. There, Your value is not. Yeah. Where yeah. You, 
where you're not going to be perfect in any of these issues. And, and it is important that we know that there is grace. There's a lot of churches out there who don't do this correctly. They either it's all grace and no repentance and no mortifying of the sins. We do want to mortify our sins. That's why this is important. We're, when we say these kind of things, like we assume that we're talking to somebody who hates sin, right? Like if you're a believer and you hate sin and you don't want to sin, mortifying the flesh is something you already want to do, but you can't, you can't address people who are not saved the same way because it's not going to make any sense to them. And they don't have the capability that a believer is going to have to see sin in the way that we see it because we've been given the desires of God, an unbeliever in your church that's that's never been there before. That's hurting. they're, They're not going to understand if you say, you know, something harsh or judgmental about what they're wearing or how they're behaving or telling them that they have to behave in a certain way. You can't be, you can't be a member of this church. Um, if you're not going to wear this purity ring and swear all these promises, no, no, no. Membership needs to be based on the gospel. It needs to be based on salvation on whether or not somebody has shown the fruits of the spirit, they are saved. Why would we base, why would we base salvation on a work whenever we are literally told to do the opposite? It makes no sense to me. So yeah, I think, I think that we have to face this as a church, as a body of believers, it's been used to abuse to a point where I almost don't want to talk about this side of it because of the feminists, because of the feminist movement. We have pushed against that in a way where this has been promoted and it's, we've gone in a completely different balance. Like that we've gone off balance to, Mm -hmm. to go against feminism. We talk about being a submissive wife and how important it is. And we are not saying that it's not important to be a submissive wife because we both believe that that is something that scripture teaches, but the church is, using that as an abuse against women and abuse against girls and an imbalance that's gone way too far the other way. So we have to talk about both sides of the imbalance or we're going to be imbalanced. <laughs> so I'm glad that you want to talk about this. This is important. It's not, you know, if, it's not my favorite. If anybody topic. gives you a hard time, you just send them to my TikToks. I get, I can block them there. I just oh, block nice. them. I did oh, this right. one and I was like, if you're mean to me, I'm just going to block you. Yes. Because it's not edifying. It's not helping anybody. Mm-mm, not going to put up with that. But I'm sure you don't want to block people. So I don't know if you can block people even on YouTube. But Oh, yeah, you can. Totally can. Oh, you can. Absolutely. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. I sure can. You guys keep that in mind in the comment section. Okay, I don't want to block anybody. But I think we all no, do it's it. An, it's an important conversation. And it's not one that we should be afraid to have. It's right. not one that anybody needs to be afraid, of, afraid to have. So, yeah. you know. We should, we should be discussing even, all of the issues. All of them yeah. should be open for discussion. Should because be. this is how we work through it, right? Like, how are we supposed to learn and grow if we're just right. so terrified of being beaten up in the comment section? I don't care about that. So I'm just going to keep on. Like I keep saying on the mega live list, this is my show. So I'm going to keep eating Oreos and talking about squirrels. But I am so thankful that you came on the program and discussed this with me. I really appreciate you going through the trouble. You guys, if you want to check out Kristen in her TikTok, I am putting links down below. But you're also on Instagram and Facebook. So people can find you in multiple yes. different areas, not just TikTok. Do I recommend TikTok? Yes. Kristen's TikTok is epic. But you can also find her in other places. <laughs> If you want to. Yes, you can. Thank you for being on the program with me again. Yes, you're so welcome. I love I love talking to you. It's always so much fun. We have a good time. Yes. Yeah, humble bees. I sure hope that, that was as edifying for you as it was for me. This is something that we're definitely only something that we want to be concerned about for youth and even for young adults. And sometimes of course for adults. If you have had this situation when you were growing up and it has hurt you and you feel like the church is the uh, one that let you down. I just want to point out that there is the buildings that call themselves church. And then there is the body of Christ that is the church. And as believers, we are not perfect. I'm not saying that it's not possible for for believers to make this mistake, but I am saying that the truth of the gospel is just as true, whether or not somebody else has said something falsely, your value is only going to be found in that truth. It's not something external. If it was, then we could all just put on a really, really pretty Christian face and be fine. That's not what the Bible teaches us. You have to repent of your sins. Everybody sins. It doesn't matter if you go your whole life being sexually pure. You're going to lie. You're going to think sinful thoughts. You're you're going to sin. Everybody does. And when you fall short, you can repent of those sins, put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if God grants you the gift of repentance and salvation, this whole topic becomes something a lot easier for you to do and deal with and handle and understand because whenever we are forgiven and our desires change, then you're going to want that. This is really the big issue with all of this is the desire of a lost heart is not going to desire the things of God. So if you have been hurt by this, please don't allow that to color your opinion of every Christian or every church, because there are churches out there who understand the balance in this. We, we know they exist. So if your particular church is imbalanced in this, don't be afraid to mention a need for balance because it, it is 
hurtful and it has long-term effects on youth that have grown up being taught these things incorrectly. So it's something that is a blessing from God whenever you are married that he has given us this blessing. So we want to make sure that we are addressing this correctly and biblically. So hopefully this was as, as much uh, for you as it was for me. I'm very thankful for everything that Kristen had to talk to us about tonight. I really, really enjoyed getting to have her back on the program. Hopefully she'll come back a um, bunch more times so that we can continue to just have fun, awesome conversations about super important theological topics. Also, just in case you are listening to this and not watching, I just want to point out that there are other members of the Tulips and Honey Hub. We have a whole channel of podcasters here, people who podcast all throughout the week. My channel, my show comes out on Mondays and other people's come out throughout the week. So if you are watching on YouTube, this makes no sense just ignore it don't worry about that but for the listeners i just want to make sure that you guys knew if you saw other people throughout the week it's okay it's supposed to be happening it's a it's a a tulips and honey channel it's just not something that i remember to mention often enough so i'm mentioning it now just in case you guys are curious and if you are um watching on youtube or if you are active on facebook or instagram or twitter and you want to get the chance to ask me questions or talk directly to me every friday i try most fridays Sometimes on Saturdays, but most Fridays I go live at uh, seven thirty Central Standard Time. So you can join me live on our Friday Mega Live list where we talk about, you know, squirrels and Oreos. But also I answer your questions and we go through prayer requests. Also we do um, recommendations and shout outs and all that good stuff. So make sure that you're checking that out on Fridays. And other than that, I love you, wonderful humble bees. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks for listening, humble bees. This is Tulips and Honey. Over and out. I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. issues constantly so i understand their discernment was tingling yes spidey spidey like, discernment spidey discernment what? tingling so you can now pin the what oh it just told me to do something and i lost it what did it oh i, I clicked a button i didn't mean to click uh, i'm sorry i didn't mean to fix it i'm sorry oh no now we're both on screen okay um Uh-oh. it wants me to pin something that's okay did you see the earthquake that just happened here no did you literally have an earthquake no. or did something <laughs> run by okay no, so the dogs my, have to zoom me my dog my my dog was laying against the table and he decided to scratch. So my whole camera was going. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's I'm not crying. what I was praying for. <laughs> I totally cried. I cried. You did not send enough oh. money to Kenneth Copeland or Benny Hinn. I didn't expect. Also, there was some behavior that was not pure. And I was like, stop it. I don't want any more puppies for a while. Stop it. No. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No There's flirting. No flirting. not wasting any time. Nope. He's like, well, the house is empty now. No, no, sir. The house is not empty. I am sitting right here and I do not want to witness that. Really does love me. So. I'm getting attacked by a fly. It's like I just thought you were, me. you know, um, I do. yeah, uh, moving in the spirit. No, we don't do that here. <laughs> just take some shears, some scissors, and cut it or shade it. Do you have a cheese grater? No, I'll get one though. Why don't I have a cheese grater? I just realized I the other day that I needed one. I don't know how to adult. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. It's okay. You did Taekwondo at the back of Walmart. So yeah. you better watch.